The Tokyo Olympic Games finally get underway after a year delay due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, it's on July 23rd that the opening ceremonies will take place. And this is where many of the athletes will stay. It's the Athletes' Village. I'm Michio Ishida. In this episode of CNA Correspondence, I'll take you through the memory of pride and struggles of Japan and the long road to Tokyo 2020. International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the Games of the 32nd Olympiad in 2020 are awarded to the city of Tokyo. I still remember how jubilant the crowds were when it was announced that Tokyo had won the bid to host the 2020 Olympic Games, making it the first Asian city to hold the Summer Games twice. Go Tokyo! Japan was riding high. Its Olympic team just returned from the Rio de Janeiro Games in 2016, bringing home a total of 41 medals, including 12 gold. A sense of pride and confidence fills the air. Athletic achievements aside, locally and internationally, there was a belief of an economic resurgence of Japan. Japan was a very different country in 2013 when it won the bid to host the 2020 Games. Just two years ago, a magnitude 9 earthquake shook northeastern Japan, triggering the world's worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl. And people were downcast about the country's future following two decades of deflation. The successful bid in 2013 gave the country and then Prime Minister Shinzo Abe a much needed boost, not just psychologically, but economically as well. Tokyo was uh, uh, chosen uh, to host the 2020 Tokyo Olympic. Uh, that was September 2013. At that time, Japan was still you know, very, in a very weak economic condition because uh, you know, Japan was still suffering from this uh, Lehman shock and then also Japan experienced this uh, March 11th earthquake. Then Mr. Abe became prime minister and then they just started to do this uh, lots of massive monetary easing and some additional public investment. Japan faced some economic growth, a little bit higher. And, and, and I think partly because this, uh, the to Tokyo was selective and as a result, uh, lots of uh, construction started again. The economic progress brought back memories of the glory days of the 1960s. In 1959, 14 years after the end of World War II, Tokyo was chosen to host the 1964 Olympic Games. The 1964 Olympics were the first held in Japan and in Asia, although Tokyo had won the right to host the 1940 Olympics. They were canceled because of the outbreak of World War II. The war ended in 1945 and left Japan in ruins. But by 1964, the country was already the fourth largest economy by GDP in the world, behind the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. 1964 is a time that when Japanese economy was facing high economic growth, like a two-digit economic growth, and then still Japanese people are about to get richer. And so, you know, people are having a black and white TV. So when the Olympic happened, everybody switched to the color TV and, you know, people still about to get richer. So everybody was very excited. And uh, this, uh, when this Tokyo Olympic uh, game uh, took place in 1964, 
uh, the, the government also spend a lot of money uh, to accelerate the pace of this uh, increasing infrastructure, like subway, like a highway, you know, express train. So everything came very fast. So that created a lot of momentum. The 1964 Games were a great success, ushering in Japan's return on the global stage as a peaceful and economically confident nation. Tokyo was the site for the 1964 Olympic Games. And now I'm going to meet a man who was actually involved in that Olympic Games. He lives right here. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello, Mr. Yoboto. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Please come in. OK. Thank you. 79-year-old Hikaru Iwamoto showed me the precious yes. jacket he stowed away for years. Yeah, this is the little it. gift that he got to keep from his one-month gig as an interpreter for the 1964 Tokyo Olympic Games. So, how does it feel? Well, uh, honestly speaking, a little bit tight. <laughs> Yeah, I gained went weight since then by more than 10 kilos. <laughs> it's been 57 years. At the time, he was a senior at Tokyo a Institute of Technology, a state-run yes. university. His schoolmates agreed to help him complete his thesis, so he took time off to become an interpreter for the Chilean Olympic delegation. On the way to the school, I usually take a Yamanote line and I saw an ad advertisement inside a car which uh, tells that we are recruiting interpreters for Tokyo Olympic Games. That, so I thought maybe I could uh, take this opportunity and uh, submitted a paper document to, to qualify myself. I was officially hired as an as, uh, interpreter for the games. Mm. Yeah. Back in those days, there were not many English speakers in Japan. Mr. Iwamoto's foreign language skill got him a front row seat to the grand opening of the 1964 games. The French girl was very popular, so I was anxious to see her with my own eyes. So I was standing in the very front of, in the field, field track. That was very exceptional. Yes. Much has changed in Japan since the 1964 games. It's now this a fast-aging uh, society. Rapid economic growth, like big families, oh, is no longer the norm. This is... It's been 57 years, but Mr. Iwamoto's English language skill did not get rusty. He now works as a contract translator in Shinagawa, a major business district in Tokyo. Looking back, he's proud of how far Japan has come. Well, it's um, a different Tokyo from 1964. Yes, of course, yeah. Very different. Mm -hmm. 64 Still, yeah. was kind of starting year of modern Tokyo. So I have to admit it. The game was the big chance for Japanese to prove we are not different. So this kind of emotion must have come from some feeling that uh, we failed in the previous war and we wanted to prove that uh, we do uh, better. He recalled that the mood was very different from what Japan is going through right now. Today, there are people who say, let's do it, and there are people who say, no, no, don't do it. Mm. But at that time, everybody was happy to have the Tokyo Olympic Games. Many Japanese think the government is sacrificing public health for the Olympics at a time when COVID-19 is still spreading in the country. But for many athletes who have been training hard for the Olympics, they are ready to overcome any obstacles to be part of the Games.
Leaving the humanitarian crisis at home behind them, these South Sudanese athletes are focused on the task at hand, training for the Tokyo Olympics. Every step forward is not easy for them. The young African nation where they hail from has been mired in violent conflict for close to a decade now. As they chase the Olympic dream, they're cheered on by many people. Lucia is training for the women's 100 meter. She's joined by Akun, who will take part in the 400 meter race. And Michael, a Paralympian for the 100 meter race. Invited by the Japan International Cooperation Agency, the team has been training in Japan for nearly two years now. There's been problem because we have no, no, no truck, even uh, no support. Because the country is uh, new, no, no development, no any, uh, no any support from the government. Actually, they are, they are, they are not uh, comfortable. And then the training also, we cannot give them a hard training because they are, uh, they are hungry, no food. The player, when the player is not satisfied, you cannot give the uh, hard, uh, hard uh, training. But here, they are okay. <laughs> Eating yakisoba noodles, rice, and miso soup using chopsticks. It takes some getting used to the Asian staple foods, but the athletes have no complaint. Back home, having proper meals every day is not a given. Years of civil war have resulted in severe food shortages in South Sudan. In 2014, the country suffered what the UN Security Council called the worst food crisis in the world. Today, millions of South Sudanese are still in need of humanitarian assistance. At the time we came, there was actually, it was very hard. They have no, no any good record, but when we are here now, they improve. They, they change their records, the records they came with it now, they, they are in, in, in new, in new records now. The postponement of the Tokyo Olympic Games due to COVID-19 turned out to be a blessing in disguise for them, as they have more time to train. The South Sudanese athletes could not have stayed in Japan here in Maibashi City so long without the support of many people, not only the city of Maibashi, but these volunteers here. These Japanese coaches who have competed in top national competitions and language volunteers make training possible for them. The host also took care to provide a wholesome experience for their guests. Language lessons aside, a computer class has been created just for the South Sudanese athletes. Yeah, it's, it's very important yeah, to know about the computer and also the language. Yeah. Sometimes you can, you, can, you can read some words, but uh, some words can become a little bit difficult. Yeah. After the Olympic and Paralympic Games, they will finally bid farewell to Japan. Maibashi is not the only Japanese town that hosts foreign athletes ahead of the Tokyo Games. About 300 kilometers away from Maebashi is Shimada in Shizuoka Prefecture. The rural city has been chosen to host the Mongolian wrestling team and Singapore's table tennis team. 
Many towns and cities throughout Japan are registered as host towns for national Olympic teams. They mingle with athletes, hold exchange programs such as in sports and culture. But that's not happening in many towns and cities this time due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Officials in Shimada City said they were prepared if their invited guests decided to cancel plans for centralized training with the virus still spreading in Japan. But Team Singapore arrived. This is the third training camp we are having here. Okay, as you, have, you can see, they offer uh, world-class training facilities with uh, all the rubber mats and all the Olympic model table and such a huge training hall. And because of us coming, they also installed uh, air conditioning. So, and the people here are also very supportive of us. Uh, so every training camp, we love to come here. The Shimada Singapore ties blossomed since 2016 when Tokyo was selected as the host city of the 2020 Olympics. But the training environment is very different from pre-COVID-19 times. There are many COVID-19 protocols to follow. For example, we can only stay uh, at our level, the hotel, and we are not even allowed to press the button of the lift. So everywhere we are escorted and even the meals is all separate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's very, it's very strict, but uh, it's also good and it's for the safety of the team. When the team enters the athletes' village in Tokyo, they will mix with other national teams and again be subjected to strict COVID-19 guidelines. Some 15,400 athletes are expected for the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Close to half of them will be women, making Tokyo 2020 the first gender balanced games in history. The power of women is highlighted at this Tokyo Olympic Games and I do see some powerful women out there. <laughs> 21-year-old Wakabahara has one goal when she makes her debut at the Tokyo Olympics representing Japan's women's rugby sevens team. The first-time Olympian wants to show the world the beauty of women's rugby. Rugby has long been a popular sport in Japan, but it's generally regarded as a men's sport. In 2016, Rugby Sevens was contested in the Summer Olympics for the first time. Japan's women's national team Sakura Sevens also took part at the Games in Rio de Janeiro. But unlike their male counterparts, the Japanese public can barely recognize the players of Sakura Sevens. Rugby has long been a popular sport for men in Japan, and its popularity was boosted in 2019 when Japan hosted the World Cup and the men's national team advancing to the quarterfinals. Well, it's hoped for this Tokyo Olympic Games, the women can create a similar momentum. More so because the Tokyo Games will be the first Olympics to have an almost equal number of female and male athletes. Back in 1996, only 34% of the athletes competing at the Olympics were women. But the gender equality drive suffered a major setback in February when Yoshiro Mori was forced to step down as Tokyo 2020 president after he was criticized for making inappropriate remarks about women. Mr. Mori, a former prime minister, was quoted as saying women talk too much and that meetings with many female board members would take a lot of time. Seiko Hashimoto, a seven-time Olympian in speed skating and cycling, succeeded Mr. Mori. 
In a matter of two weeks, she raised the ratio of women in the Tokyo 2020 Executive Board from 20% to 40%. Hello, Konnichiwa, Matsuda. Nice to meet you. Maki Kobayashi is one of the highest ranking women in the Tokyo 2020 Organizing Committee. Uh, without her determination, uh, I don't think we could have done it in two weeks, raising the, the, uh, the number of um, uh, executive board members. Because the people always say that, ah, oh, but we have to change all these rules first, so it takes one month. And she said, ah, oh, are there anything that we can do? So that was really, uh, she was really pushing forward. Uh. Ms. Kobayashi joined the Tokyo 2020 Committee from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She confessed that she faced discrimination in the early days because she was a woman. When I entered the ministry, um, uh, among the career diplomats, which was around um, 23, 4, 5, there were only two women. And when I had the entrance examination, there was an oral exam, I was asked whether I'm thinking about marrying, which is, I'm sure, not asked uh, uh, to, to men. This year, for example, in the Ministry uh, for Career Diplomats, uh, there's one more woman than men, and it's, it's totally equal or plus. So I think uh, the society is really improving. She has come a long way. At Tokyo 2020, Ms. Kobayashi will supervise up to 8,000 staff. Promoting gender equality aside is the very challenging task of hosting a safe and secure Olympics with the COVID-19 situation still evolving. We were preparing until last March, and we thought it was on the right direction. The challenging thing is that the, the situations vary uh, according to the time. Uh, what we prepared in last November, December is, is really different. I think the Japanese are not used to be, you know, being <laughs> flexible. <laughs> That's one thing. Yes. Because the Japanese yes. like to mm. have things fixed and mm. follow that rule. We have to be flexible enough to change uh, some of the things, uh, to, to adapt to the situations. And that, that's pretty challenging for us. Uh, I think it's probably going to be a, another legacy for the games. <laughs> Despite all the uncertainties, first-time Olympian and women's rugby player Wakaba was aiming high. Sakura Sevens to be a medal of competition, a medal that I have to win. 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 <laughs> but fans will only be able to witness that through the screens. With spectators banned from the venues in Tokyo and other places due to COVID-19, the greatest athletes of the world will, for the first time, compete with no fans to cheer them on.